Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cut Rate Commander, the series in which we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit and today we'll be looking at Bolas's personal assassin and regent, Ramsey's assassin lord. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see who won last week's poll and what commanders you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So, with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Ramsey's Assassin Lord is a 4-4 human assassin with death touch that costs 2, a blue and a black, and has the following abilities. Other assassins we control gain plus 1 plus 1. Whenever a player loses the game, if they were attacked that turn by an assassin we control, we win the game. Taking a closer look at his core stats, Ramses is sporting a midweight CMC along with a matching stat block for his cost, death touch to enable easier trades, and a pair of abilities that not only empower assassins, but also turn them into a unique alternate win condition for us that fundamentally changes how we play the game. Quickly running down his first ability, it's a simple no frills anthem for assassins, which while basic is appreciated by the tribe as many of its members have very low stat blocks and this boost will help increase their damage output and survivability. But Ramsey's second ability is why we're here, as it effectively turns the game from a fatal four-way into a singles match with occasional outside interference. Which means, so long as we control Ramsey's, we need to only eliminate a single player instead of three to ensure our victory. And while yes, this is a very powerful ability, there are a few caveats that need to be kept in mind. Firstly, while one would think this ability would incentivize picking on a single player, that's in fact only partially true, since we only get to win the game if we eliminate that player on the turn we attack them with an assassin. So while it may be tempting to focus all our resources into picking a single player's board apart, if we don't have the means to win on our turn, then all we've done is provide our opponents with a clear path for them to knock them out instead, leaving us with fewer resources and still two other players to contend with. So instead, it's usually more prudent to play a slow methodical game, building up our resources, dealing with singular threats as they arise, and waiting for the perfect opportunity to single out a vulnerable opponent and then go in for the coup de grace. Secondly, it should be noted that we don't have to eliminate the opponent in question by reducing their life total to zero, as the only condition we need to meet is an assassin we control attacking them on the turn they lose, which opens up some interesting instant player elimination options that make it significantly easier for our typically low power assassins to fulfill their contract. And should we feel particularly nasty, Infect is also a very potent way to win games, making it so that we only need to deal 10 damage on top of only needing to eliminate one opponent. So, as we can divulge from his abilities, Ramses is an assassin-themed commander that's also a potent alternate win con. And to make the most out of his abilities, we'll be taking this build in a slower, more control-oriented direction, positioning our assassins to protect us and eliminate our opponent's threats while waiting for the perfect opening to go in for the kill and secure our victory. Of course, that means we'll be running plenty of assassins to benefit from and trigger Ramsey's abilities, ranging from ones that serve as either one-shot or repeatable removal to pick off any problematic threats, to death-touching assassins that will de-incentivize our opponents from attacking us unless they want to lose their best creatures to their poison blades. And with so many assassins in our league, we'll of course be running plenty of tribal payoffs to ensure we get plenty of value as we play them or attack in with them, in addition to means to ensure they can get in for damage with little risk. And lastly, to ensure they can get the job done, we'll be including a decent number of cards that either devastate our opponent's life totals as they connect, or are instead capable of eliminating players outright without the need to chew through their life totals, alongside a handful of means to tutor them up from our deck so we have access to them when the opportunity presents itself. So, with his impressive credentials verified, it's time to let this professional assassin fulfill his contract, and we can rest assured that he'll get the job done, as his mastery of assassination even impressed Nicobolus to the point of making him the Imperial Assassin, with him and his cabal silencing anyone who would oppose the Dragon Emperor with ruthless efficiency, thus ensuring that the lives of any planeswalkers foolish enough to face us are forfeit the moment that Ramses takes the contract for their heads. So, now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, we have a trio of assassins joining our league with Ghoul Draws Assassin, Ruthless Ripper, and Hired Poisoner. 
Cool Draw's Assassin is a 1 1 with level up for 1 in a black that, at level 2 and 3, becomes a 2 2. We can tap and pay a black to give target creature minus 2 minus 2 until end of turn, and at level 4 plus becomes a 4 4 with the same ability but increased to minus 4 minus 4 instead, making it a cheap early drop that we can pump mana into to turn into a respectable and repeatable form of non destruction removal. Ruthless Ripper and Hired Poisoner are both 1-1s with Death Touch, the former also having Morph by revealing a black card and having target player lose 2 life when turned face up, but both primarily being run as cheap Death Touchers that will usually trade up if our opponents decide to swing into them or block them. And then we close out the slot with the Honorary Assassin Changeling Outcast, a 1-1 with Changeling that can't block or be blocked, its built-in evasion being very useful to deliver deadly on damage effects to our opponents while still working with Ramses and our other tribal payoffs thanks to being considered an assassin. Then moving on to the CMC2 slot, the first half brings us some targeted removal assassins with Solemgar Assassin, Scarblade Elite, and Kiku Knight's Flower. Solemgar Assassin is a 2-1 with Megamorph for 2 and a black that can't be blocked by creatures with power greater than it, and, when turned face up, destroys target creature of CMC3 or less, making it a decent removal option to pick off utility creatures if we Megamorph it, or another evasive assassin we can use to get in for damage and on damage effects if hardcast or facing a board full of big creatures. Scarblade Elite is a 2-2 we can tap and exile an assassin from our graveyard to destroy target creature, providing us with repeatable and unconditional creature removal at no mana cost as we lose our assassins throughout the course of the game. Kiku is a 1-1 we can pay 2 double black and tap to have target creature deal damage to itself equal to its power, again giving us access to reliable and repeatable removal we can sit on to pick off threats or to deal with creatures that swing into us. Then we wrap up this lot with Avon Heartstabber, Guild Sworn Prowler, and Thrill Kill Assassin, all of which either have or can gain Death Touch. The first being a 1 1 flyer that gains it as well as plus 2 plus 2 if there are 5 plus different CMC spells in our graveyard, the second being a 2 1 that has Death Touch by default and draws us a card if it dies outside of blocking, and the last being a 1 2 with Death Touch and Unleash, all making it even harder for our opponents to swing into us or block properly without suffering heavy losses. Proceeding to the CMC3 slot, we have another batch of assassins capable of repeatable removal with Royal Assassin, Stalking Assassin, and Dark Impersonator. Royal Assassin is a 1-1 we can tap to destroy target tapped creature, making it a solid source of manaless removal to deal with big creatures that swing into us or others. Stalking Assassin is another 1-1 that we can either pay 3 a blue and tap to tap down target creature, or pay 3 a black and tap it to destroy target tapped creature, again giving us another way to deal with creatures as they swing in, or tapping them down itself to set up the kill on a later turn. Dark Imposter is a 2-2 we can pay 4 and double black to exile target creature and put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it, as well as having it gain all the activated abilities of the creatures it exiles, its hefty removal cost being somewhat softened by being non-destruction and growing it as we use it, as well as occasionally allowing us to benefit from any activated abilities its target may have possessed. Agent of Fates then joins us as an additional source of continual removal, being a 3-2 with Death Touch that, whenever we target it with a spell, has each opponent sacrifice a creature. Its Edict removal making our small handful of targeted spells even more dangerous while still being usable as a Death Touch or otherwise. It's then on to some single use removal with Big Game Hunter, a 1-1 with Madness for a Black that, when it ETBs, destroys target creature of power 4 plus and prevents it from regenerating, enabling it to bring down big targets reliably and occasionally only costing us a single mana if we find ourselves overdrawing. We then have some hard to block assassins joining us as we move deeper into this slot with Sukata Assassin, Zathrid Slyblade, and Midnight Assassin. Sukata Assassin is a 1 1 with fear that, whenever it attacks and isn't blocked, gives the defending player a poison counter. Its built in evasion allowing it to get in for damage fairly reliably to deliver small doses of poison counters to our target, prepping them for the large final dose we'll be using to finish them off. Zathrid Slyblade is a 2-1 with Hexproof that lets us pay 3 and a black to have it lose Hexproof and gain First Strike and Death Touch until end of turn, its ability making it difficult to block or attack into if we have mana open, and its built-in targeted removal protection making it ideal to suit up with our evasion granting sources and on damage win cons. Midnight Assassin is a 1-2 flyer with Death Touch, allowing it to defend against any big threats in the air that would otherwise be out of reach of our other Death Touchers, while also being able to safely get in for damage itself. A pair of legendary assassins are then up next with Maori the Killing Quill and Virtus the Veiled. 
Mari is a 3-2 that, whenever an opponent's creature dies, exiles it with a hit counter, in addition to granting all assassins, mercenaries, and rogues we control death touch, and, whenever they deal combat damage to a player, lets us remove a hit counter from a card that player owns in exile to draw a card and create two treasure tokens. Providing our build with a great source of passive graveyard hate, a solid payoff for our assassins in the form of AoE death touch ramp and draw, and whose hit counter distribution helps set up one of our other win cons, more on that later. Virtus is a 1-1 with death touch that, whenever he deals combat damage to a player, has that player lose half their life rounded up, making him incredibly dangerous to unwary opponent's life totals and getting even better when granted evasion through other sources to get in for damage more easily. We then have Bloodline Pretender closing out our assassins in this slot, being a 2-2 with Changeling that, when it ETBs, has us choose a creature type, gaining a plus one plus one counter whenever a creature of that type ETBs under our control, making it a decent tribal payoff that grows into a sizable threat as we assemble our assassins. It's then onto some non-assassin entrants to close out this slot, starting with the card advantage sources Morbid Opportunist and Grazalix Alithid Scholar. Morbid Opportunist is a 1-3 that, whenever one or more creatures die, draws us a card, limited to once per turn, taking full advantage of our plethora of removal effects by turning them into a steady stream of card advantage. Grazalix is a 3-2 that, whenever a creature we control becomes blocked, gives us the option to return it to our hand, and, whenever one or more creatures we control deal combat damage to a player, draws us a card. They're on damage draw, turning our evasive assassins into sources of continual card advantage, and their AoE bounce effect allowing us to swing in with our ETB removal assassins to force our opponents to either take the damage, or block them and bounce them back to our hand to be used again. And finally, closing out the CMC3 slot, we have Burnished Heart, a 2-2 that we can pay 3 in sack to put 2 basic lands from our deck into play tapped, serving as a decent source of land base ramp to help speed up our mana base. Closing in on the end now, it's back onto the Assassin removal game plan as we enter the CMC4 slot, leading off with Necrotal, Notorious Assassin, and Etrata the Silencer. Necrotal is a 2-1 with First Strike that, when it ETBs, destroys target non-black creature, providing us with another ETB removal effect that leaves behind a First Striking body which we can use alongside our Death Touch or Infect Granting sources to continue removing creatures. Notorious Assassin is a 2-2 who, despite its spell shaper typing, has been eroded to be an assassin and lets us pay to a black tap it and discard a card to destroy target non-black creature and prevent it from being regenerated, enabling us to turn dead cards in the late game into additional spot removal as needed. Itrata is a 3-5 that's unblockable and, whenever she deals combat damage to a player, exiles target creature that player controls with a hit counter on it, causing that player to lose the game if they have three such creatures in exile, and then shuffling herself back into the deck. On her own, serving as decent removal and a slow win con, but when combined with other sources of hit counter generation such as Mari becomes much deadlier, sometimes only needing to connect once to win us the game. Speaking of which, we'll also be running Ravenloft Adventurer, a 3-4 that, whenever an opponent's creature would die, exiles it with a hit counter, gives us the initiative when it ETBs, and, whenever it attacks, if we've completed a dungeon, has the defending player take damage equal to the number of creatures they own in exile with hit counters on them providing Etrata and Mari with additional sources of hit counters for them to make use of, and its introduction of the initiative into the game providing us with additional resources from the Undercity. We then wrap up this slot with Thorn of the Dusk Rose, a 1-3 with Death Touch that, when it ETBs, makes us the Monarch. Like the previous entrant, introducing a steady stream of value in the form of card advantage to the game which we can easily hold on to thanks to our arsenal of removal options. And finally, reaching the CMC5 slot, we have our last assassin and creature with Massacre Girl, a 4-4 with Menace that, when she ETBs, has all other creatures lose minus one minus one until end of turn, repeating the process every time another creature dies that turn providing us with an in-tribe means to wipe the board that bypasses destruction protection, which also leaves us with a 4-4 body after the massacre is over. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. Beginning in the CMC1 slot, we have its only entrance with Tainted Strike, which gives target creature plus one plus zero and infect until end of turn, potentially turning any unblocked or evasive assassin into a deadly dose of poison counters, which when combined with our other sources of infect can make for a nasty surprise to win us the game out of nowhere. Then entering the CMC2 slot, we start off with our spell disruption suite consisting of counter spell, arcane denial, and negate, all of which counter target spell, the first countering any spell, the second also countering any spell but having its owner draw two while we draw one on the next upkeep, and the last being limited to non-creature spells, all serving as additional insurance to prevent our opponents from interfering with our turn when we're about to go in for the finishing blow. 
And finally, closing out this slot in our instance, we have Infernal Grasp and Go for the Throat, both of which destroy target creature, the former costing us two life to use, and the latter being limited to non-artifact creatures, both giving us access to instant speed removal outside our creature base to deal with threats as they arise. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. Skipping to the CMC2 slot, we have the draw spells Sign in Blood and Knight's Whisper, both of which draw us two and have us lose two life, making them cheap and efficient draw in the early game, with the former also allowing us to target another player with it just in case that extra two damage is enough to close out the game for us. Then skipping again to the CMC4 slot, we have the Tutor's Diabolic Tutor and Mastermind's Acquisition, both of which let us search our deck for any card and put it into our hand, granting us easy access to all our win cons and payoffs with the added benefit of not having to reveal the card we select to our opponents, allowing us to keep the element of surprise. The CMC5 slot then stays on the tutoring game plan with Increasing Ambition and Razaketh's Right, both of which again search our deck for any card and add it to our hand. The former also having flashback for 7 and a black and searching for 2 cards instead if we cast it from our graveyard, and the latter having cycling for a black. Again, giving us more ways to search up our win cons and payoffs, this time with some upside to justify their increased costs. And finally, reaching the CMC6 slot in our last sorcery, we have River's Rebuke, which returns all non-land permanence target player controls to their hand, making it a potent way to wash away our primary target's defenses, clearing the way for our assassins to deliver the final blow for the win. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. Starting in the CMC1 slot, we have Aqueous Form, an aura that makes the enchanted creature unblockable and lets it scry one when it attacks making it a cheap way to grant any of our assassins permanent evasion and some passive card selection as they safely crack in. The CMC2 slot then brings us another aura in the form of Phyresis, which gives the enchanted creature infect, giving our build another way to stack poison counters on an opponent until we build up a lethal dose to eliminate them and win from there. It's then on to the CMC3 slot and its lone entrant, Haunted One, which, whenever our commander becomes tapped, gives all creatures that share a type with it that we control plus 2 plus 0 and undying, enabling powerful alpha strikes if we're aiming to close out the game and synergizing well with our large number of death touch assassins so they come back stronger after taking down whatever blocked them. The CMC4 slot then adds Reconnaissance Mission to our arsenal, which lets us draw a card whenever a creature we control deals combat damage to a player and has cycling for two, giving us another way to turn our evasive and difficult to block assassins into additional card advantage as they continue to get in. And finally, reaching the CMC5 slot in our last two enchantments, we have the Tribal Payoffs, Kindred Discovery, and Reflections of Lejara. Kindred Discovery has us choose a creature type when it ETBs, drawing us a card whenever a creature of that type we control ETBs or attacks, making it a very powerful tribal payoff in the form of card advantage in our build and a critical piece to tutor up as quickly as possible to ensure our hands stay nice and full as we build up our board. Reflections of Lejara also has us choose a creature type when it ETBs, this time copying any spell that we cast that matches the chosen type, allowing us to double up on our number of assassins along with the removal and death touch they provide. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. The CMC1 slot begins with the ramp option Soul Ring and Wayfarer's Bobble, the former tapping for two colorless and the latter letting us pay two, tap it and sack it to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, each serving as cheap means to speed up our mana base to get to our bigger spells faster. We then close out this slot with Vorpal Sword, an equipment that equips for double black, gives the equipped creature plus two plus zero and death touch, and lets us pay five and triple black too until end of turn if the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, have that player lose the game. Initially making it a cheap source of death touch with offensive power boost attached, and in the late game turning into a very real threat as we swing in with it that our opponents won't be able to ignore unless they want to lose instantly. Then moving on to the CMC2 slot, we open with our Mana Rock Suite, consisting of Arcane Signet, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Demir Signet, which we can pay one and tap for both our colors, Talisman of Dominance, which taps for a colorless or instead either of our colors if we take a damage, Felwar Stone, which taps for any color our opponent's lands would be able to produce, and Mind Stone, which taps for a colorless and we can pay one, tap it and sack it to draw a card, all giving our build even more access to cheap ramp to speed up our mana base even further. We then close out this slot with Swift Foot Boots and Winged Boots, both being equipment that equip for one, the former giving the equipped creature Hexproof and Haste, while the latter gives it Flying and Ward 4 instead, both serving as decent protection sources to keep our commander and other high value assassins alive, while also providing them additional powerful keywords for them to make use of as well. We then have another pair of equipment as we move on to the CMC3 slot with Quietus Spike and Whisper Silk Cloak. 
Quiet as Spike equips for 3, gives the equipped creature death touch, and if the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, has that player lose half their life rounded up. Instantly turning the equipped assassin into an immediate threat that our opponents will either have to deal with or have their life totals cleaved in half. Whisper Silk Cloak equips for 2, makes the equipped creature unblockable and grants it Shroud. Providing its wearer with superb protection and evasion, which becomes even better when combined with our on-damage win cons to quickly close out games for us. Then closing out the CMC3 slot, we have Strixhaven Stadium, which we can tap to generate a colorless and put a point counter on it. In addition to removing a point counter from it whenever we take combat damage from a creature, and putting a point counter on it whenever a creature we control deals combat damage to an opponent. Removing all point counters from it if it has 10 or more after a successful attack to have that opponent lose the game. Making it a passable mana rock that slowly ticks up points as our evasive assassins get in, while our death touches and removal keeps those points safe until we're ready to alpha strike in for the win. And finally, reaching the CMC4 slot and our last artifact, we have Grafted Exoskeleton, an equipment that equips for 2, gives the equipped creature plus 2 plus 2 and infect, as well as sacking the equipped creature if it ever becomes unattached, making it a very nasty poison counter delivery system when combined with our evasive assassins that can generally win us the game in 2 to 3 attacks unless dealt with. That covers all our artifacts, so let's move on to our planeswalkers. Our lone planeswalker joins us in the CMC6 slot, that being Vraska Scheming Gorgon, who comes into play with 5 loyalty and has the following abilities. Her plus 2 gives all creatures we control plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn, her minus 3 destroys target creature, and her minus 10 gives all creatures we control death touch and, whenever they deal combat damage to a player, has that player lose the game until the end of the turn. Her abilities giving our assassins a nice little offensive stat bump, additional removal to deal with threats, and yet another form of instant player elimination to build up to as our assassin screen attacks for her. That covers our singular planeswalker, so let's move on to our land base. Starting with our mana lands, we have Command Tower, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Dark Water Catacombs, which we can pay one and tap to generate both our colors, Sunken Hollow, which comes into play tapped unless we control two plus basics and taps for either of our colors, Choked Estuary, which comes into play tapped unless we reveal an island or swamp and taps for either of our colors, Tainted Isle, which taps for a colorless or either of our colors instead if we control a swamp, Path of Ancestry, which comes into play tapped, taps for any color in our commander's color identity, and scries one if we use that mana to cast a creature spell that matches our commander's creature type. Myriad Landscape, which comes into play tapped, taps for a colorless and lets us pay two, tap it and sack it to put two of the same basic land from our deck into play tapped. And finally, Maestro's Theater and Obscura Storefront, both of which sack themselves when they ETB to put a basic island or swamp from our deck into play tapped and gain us one life. Then for our utility lands, we start off with Rogue's Passage and Access Tunnel, both of which tap for a colorless and make target creature unblockable, the former doing so for any creature by paying 4 and tapping it, while the latter does so by paying 3 and tapping it instead but is limited to creatures of 3 power or less, both giving our assassins easy access to evasion from our land slots. And then we close out our utility lands with Castle Lockthwain, which comes into play tapped unless we control a swamp, taps for a black, and lets us pay one double black and tap it to draw a card, dealing damage to us equal to the number of cards we have in hand afterwards, providing us with card advantage from our land slot in the event we find ourselves low on resources. And lastly, we're running 11 islands and 12 swamps as our basics to close out our land base. So, now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 31 creatures including the Commander, 6 Instants, 7 Sorceries, 6 Enchantments, 14 Artifacts, 1 Planeswalker, and 35 Lands. Looking at the stats add matter to our game plan, we have 28 Assassins, 8 cards that care about Assassins, 12 cards with Death Touch or that can grant Death Touch, 9 cards with Evasion or that can grant Evasion, 4 sources of Player Elimination, 3 sources of Infect, and 4 Tutors giving us a solid number of assassins and payoffs for them to work alongside our commander, a decent number of which have or can be granted death touch to deter attacks or evasion to reliably get in for damage, alongside a handful of player elimination effects and poison counter distribution methods to close out games with Ramses, all of which we can reliably search up thanks to our tutor suite. For general deck stats, we have 11 ramp sources, 10 card draw sources, 18 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes. Our removal being higher than normal as many of our assassins have it built right in to help us keep control of the board while we set up the kill, with our other stats falling within more normal parameters. 
Looking at our mana curve, we have 9 1 drops, 21 2 drops, 18 3 drops, 10 4 drops, 5 5 drops, and 2 6 drops leaving us with a lower midweight curve that aims to get our assassins on board quickly to take control of the game with their repeatable removal, then biding our time as we build up our resources and tutor up our win cons, until the opportunity presents itself to cast Ramses and go in for the coup de gras for the win. Currently this deck is valued at 6521, dollars not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, if we find the table not liking Infect as one of our win cons, we can easily swap them out for Biden to Thassa, Sleep, and an offer you can't refuse to give us access to more draw in both field and spell disruption instead. And the Assassin's Cruel Sadist, Hooded Assassin, and Nightshade Assassin may also warrant consideration if we want to add even more members to our league. For upgrades, Soren Markov is an excellent walker that can immediately reduce a player's life total to 10 as soon as he comes down to facilitate alpha strikes, Shizo Death's Storehouse is a superb source of evasion for our assassins from the Lancelot, and Grim Tutor makes for another solid tutor effect that we can cast even earlier. And finally, Black Market Connections provides additional ramp draw and assassins for us so long as we're willing to pay the life, and Cover of Darkness is a potent payoff for our assassins to give them all very cheap AoE evasion. And as added flavor for both of these criminal-themed cards, their price will make us feel as though we've been robbed if we choose to run them. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Firstly, I'd like to thank all the channel subscribers for helping the channel reach its 7k subscriber milestone. This channel has been growing tremendously in the past year and it's all thanks to your continued support, so thank you for helping the channel get to this point and hopefully to even greater heights. Then taking a look at the results of last week's poll, it looks like the resurrected Cabal member Braid's Arisen Nightmare has claimed the top spot, so look forward to a sacrifice heavy build featuring her next week. Moving on to this week's poll, we'll be having some mythical commanders step up to the plate, with this week's contenders being the legendary Dominarian Samurai, Tetsuo Imperial Champion, the Protector of Urborg, Soul of Windgrace, and the leader of the new coalition, Joda the Unifier. Please cast your vote in the community tab, link in the description, and let me know in the comments who you voted for and what commanders you want to see from Dominaria United in future polls. Before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel can't continue to grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And speaking of which, I'd like to thank Sahir21 for another generous donation. Thanks for the coffee, Sahir21, and thank you for the continued support. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the cut-rate commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.